So for those of you who um, have not heard of the Coriel Personalized Medicine Collaborative, this is a uh, longitudinal research study that started in 2007. And really the aim of the study is to understand the utility of receiving personal genome information. We are um, genotyping individuals, providing it back to results back to participants, and uh, doing a series of follow-up uh, behavioral studies to determine uh, to determine uh, what they're doing with that information. So are they changing their uh, diet or lifestyle based on that information? Are they sharing the information with their healthcare provider? And is their healthcare provider making any recommendations, ordering any tests, changing their care or management in any way? In addition, we're looking to identify new genetic sites that are associated with common medical conditions and drug response. As I said, the study was launched in 2007. And at this point, we have more than 6,000 participants that have enrolled. Just briefly, how the study works, uh, participants, the majority of our participants have been enrolled through group informed consent sessions. Uh, individuals actually come to the Coriel Institute or, or other group sessions that we've held. Uh, at the end of an informed consent presentation, they, if they choose, sign the consent form and spit into a tube, which is always nice in a group setting. Um, everybody loves that. Uh, after they have provided their sample, they then receive an online activation, and the remainder of the study is really conducted via the internet. Uh, people create a personalized account, they fill out a series of required questionnaires, including family history, medical history, lifestyle, demographics. Um, and once they have completed those required questionnaires, they're put in the queue for genotyping. We do our genotyping using the Affymetrix 6.0 and DMET chips currently. Um, and then once uh, results are generated based on those genotyping platforms, we are ready to release results. But here's the caveat. Um, an important component of the consent process is that participants consent to only receiving results that are approved by our advisory group called the Informed Cohort Oversight Board. And I'll go into greater detail. So this is sort of a, uh, a vetting process for how we're, we will uh, determine what results to report to participants. Um, so that's going to be the crux of the talk. And let me just finish sort of the general outline of the study, and then I'll go into greater detail about that. So once, uh, once that group approves what results will be reported, uh, re reports are prepared, and they are pushed out to participants through this uh, secure web portal. Participants get an email that say a new result is ready, um, but none of their results are communicated via email. They're always uh, pushed to go to, to log on to the secure web portal to view their personal genomic information. After they view that information, they can contact us to speak with a genetic counselor. We also have a pharmacist coach network uh, so that if they have questions about their pharmacogenomic results, they can speak with a pharmacist as well. And we follow up with a series of online questionnaires, again, asking them what they did with the information. Was it useful? Did it um, prompt any anxiety? Did they actually share the information with their healthcare provider? Because the information is going directly to a participant. So I just want to talk a little bit about, um, because the focus of this session is uh, selecting variants for the return, I want to talk a little bit about how we go through that process. Um, we, the Coriel staff actually selects what variants we want to put forward to our advisory group. And there are a series of technical guidelines, which I'll discuss, um, that guide that selection process. We then prepare a, a report that goes to um, two different advisory groups, our ICOB, Informed Cohort Oversight Board, and our Pharmacogenomics Advisory Group. Um, only those drug gene pairs that would uh, relate to drug metabolism will go to the pharmacogenomics advisory group. Everything does go to the ICOB. Uh, the ICOB reviews and approves um, or disapproves, rejects um, what we've put forward to them. Obviously, only those things that are approved go, moves forward to report development uh, and then the deployment of the report to participants. So we have two sets of technical guidelines, one for health conditions and one for drug gene pairs. Um, and it's a fairly in-depth process. This was published uh, by one of our colleagues, uh, Stack, uh, Kathy Stack, 
uh, earlier this year. So we go through a literature search for all of the looking at published GWAS. Um, we will only select studies that, uh, variants that have been replicated uh, across multiple studies, moderately sized studies, and we do have minimum cutoffs for the number of participants that need to be included. And uh, we're looking for variants that have been associated with common complex diseases, not traits. So we had actually originally considered putting forward things, uh, variants that have been associated with things like height or eye color and have since rejected that idea. Those types of variants are not included in the study. Once we've identified disease-associated variants, um, we go through a process of selecting um, a single variant per health condition currently. And looking at variant selection hierarchy, we rate uh, each variant that we've identified as potentially uh, worthy of inclusion based on whether or not it's been looked at through a meta-analysis in multiple studies, replication in multiple independent studies, or replication in multiple cohorts in a single study. Uh, we take all of that data, compile it into a nice report, and summarize it for the Informed Cohort Oversight Board. Um, and uh, only, obviously only those conditions with valid genetic associations are passed through that process. From the standpoint of pharmacogenomics, this is a slightly different process. Um, we're looking to identify and select uh, drugs and key genes that are associated. We do this by reviewing published literature as well as public databases, including the FDA table of drugs and biomarkers, PubMed, PharmGKB, um, the CYP450 uh, drug interaction table, national prescription data, and also uh, our own population and the reported medication use. Obviously, we're not as interested in reporting on a, on a uh, drug gene pair where there's one person in our entire cohort that's on that particular medication. It just wouldn't be of interest to the population. And as a result, studying utility wouldn't be all that, it wouldn't be very interesting. We also uh, review published and public data, drug, meta drug metabolism pathways, uh, PubMed again from GKB, um, and the CIP allele nomenclature database. Based on all that, we try to define key alleles and haplotypes uh, and identify a minimum set of defining variants for those haplotypes, and then select haplotypes for inclusion based on evidence scoring. So the evidence scoring is a, a detailed process. We rate different studies based on um, the greatest to obviously the lowest evidence based on whether or not there have been clinical outcome studies conducted, the uh, available pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic studies, molecular and cellular functional studies, and genetic variant uh, screening studies. So this goes into a complex scoring uh, process uh, that goes from 1 to 13. Variants that have been only seen in one study, as such as a case report, will not be included. Um, if there is functional data that suggests um, that the particular variant or haplotype or gene um, directly impacts the metabolism of, of the drug of interest that is rated more highly than if the drug is associated with, uh, I'm sorry, if the gene is associated with a, a, vari a drug that is related but not the one that we're particularly interested in. Um, obviously, this is a, a complex uh, process that I won't go into in detail, but I'm happy to talk with uh, anyone afterwards about the strength of evidence scoring system. So those are the technical guidelines that guide the selection of um, variants and, and dr drugs and health conditions that we put forward to the ICB and the PAG, but just want to briefly talk about that process itself. So. We have the Informed Cohort Oversight Board. This is an external advisory board. There are no voting members from Coriel. Uh, it's composed of scientists, medical professionals, ethicists, and community members. This is modeled after Kahana's um, ICOB concept that was published in Science in 2007, um, where an expert group would review uh, drug gene pairs, and that would be used to determine what information could be reported back to participants. So Coriel's informed cohort oversight board um, consists of 
many notable scientists, um, some of whom are in the room. Um, and actually, this group just met this past Monday. Um, their charge specifically is to determine whether he each health condition or gene involved in drug metabolism is at minimum potentially actionable. And I know David just said he hates that term. Um, <laughs> it's, it's hard to say what the cutoff should be. How do you decide what gets included? But because we want to look at the potential utility of this information, we felt like um, some level of actionability was needed. Um, so we have provided the ICOB with some guidance with respect to that. In addition, they're also charged with deter determining whether or not the genetic associations that we're uh, proposing are statistically valid. The Pharmacogenomics Advisory Group is a uh, separate board, and they are, um, were specifically chosen based on their expertise in pharmacogenomics. They provide recommendations to the ICOB, um, so their decision alone does not determine what goes out to participants. And they, this group is composed of pharmacists, pharmacologists, ethicists, and clinicians. Um, again, we have members of this group in the room um, and certainly appreciate their service. Their charge is similar but a little bit different, so it's to determine whether or not there's sufficient evidence to support the role of each gene in the metabolism of the proposed drug, whether the impact of one or more haplotypes is clinically relevant with respect to the proposed drug, and whether the drug gene uh, pair is potentially actionable. Again, the workflow of the ICUB and the PAG is that um, although both review these submissions, the decisions of the PAG are then submitted to the ICOB for approval, and there are cases where um, the ICOB does overturn a recommendation um, or rejects a, a recommendation of the PAG. Just a list of the um, currently approved diseases and drug metabolism pairs that, we've, uh, that have been approved by the ICOB so far. Uh, and acknowledgments of the staff and ICOB and PAG that uh, participate in this project. Thank you. So we have time for a couple of questions or comments now, and then uh, this session is interrupted by lunch, but we have three sh speakers after lunch and then a longer discussion session at the end of the session. Howard? Just a quick point of clarification. You had indicated that uh, a single variant would be chosen per condition. Do you mean that at a site where there are lots of different variants that are in the same haplotype block, you're only selecting one SNP? Or do you mean for a common complex disease, you will choose one and only one variant? So for example, in the case of diabetes, this gives me some concern given the plethora of uh, potentially relevant variants that exist. Um, so thank you. That's, it's an important clarification. Um, so for common complex diseases, we are currently only reporting on a single variant, and it certainly is concerning uh, given the multigenic models that are coming out and the number of different variants that are known to contribute to the risk of these common complex diseases. Um, at this point, we are working on coming up with a, a multigenic algorithm that would be approvable by the ICOB, um, not at this past ICOB meeting, but at the previous one, we had put forward some multigenic models. And the problem that we ran into is that um, they're not replicated. And so although we, can, we all agree that there are multiple uh, validated and replicated variants associated with, with each of these common diseases, how do you put forward, you know, are we gonna give people 50 different variants and make them process that? We'd prefer to give people a multigenic risk, but none of those models have been validated. Do you choose a model that has multiple validated variants within it? And so we're still trying to think through that process. In the meantime, we certainly see it as a limitation. We make it clear um, on our reports that it's a limitation. We're only providing you a very small insight into the many genetic risk factors that contribute to this. But at this point, we feel like it, it, it's one approach. Um, I will say that for Pharmacogenomics, we are using multiple variants um, the, and reporting on using the STAR uh, nomenclature that's commonly accepted. Okay. Can you comment on, um, <clears throat> so this is great work and it, it does seem like it takes a lot of effort. Could you comment on sort of the c amount of effort it takes and how this can scale? So for example, at different institutions that are tackling these same issues, 
you know, typically you can get together a committee, but then it ends up, well, maybe we discuss one, whatever is hot that, that particular, you know, month or not. How, how can the scale on, for example, do you make your knowledge available to others to, to be able to use at other institutions? And if not, how, how do you sort of see this uh, scaling beyond this particular initiative? So that's a great question and is one that is discussed routinely by our, our advisory groups. Um, the amount of preparation work that goes into each of the ICOB and PAG meetings is absolutely enormous on the part of, of the staff at Coriel um, because we really feel like as as an advisory group, they shouldn't need to go out and do um, all of the legwork to try and determine this, but we should present it to them and they should be evaluating it with you know, additional supplemental material if needed. Um, currently, we, we give them, on average, I would say four um, either condition, health conditions or drug gene pairs uh, to evaluate at each meeting. Um, we would need an army of staff in order to scale this up. Um, and so one possibility would be um, as ideas like this pick up momentum at different institutions is having different groups of people working and sharing their knowledge across different institutions. Um, I think we are happy to share our model. We have always said that we would make the decisions of the PAG transparent and we can certainly um, discuss sharing the uh, submission materials with other institutions um, so that there's some collaboration and, and um, you know, everyone isn't reinventing the wheel. Okay, I think 